You've been at Twitch for eight years. What's the evolution up until today? The core of the product has always roughly remained the same, which is being the best place for creators to monetize live streams. I think one of the biggest things that I've worked on in my time at Twitch was we replaced all of the popularity-based discovery mechanisms with uh, recommended-based sorting orders. Let's talk about some of those indicators that tell you that um, a user is enjoying certain content, so that type of content can be prioritized on their, on their feed. So a user clicked on a video and they watched it for a, you know, at least five minutes of time. That for us is ultimately success. How do you think about positioning your product in a way that allows you to maintain that type of momentum that you created? I think the biggest positioning and differentiator for us is our focus on live streaming as our core product. How are you thinking about uh, Gen AI? Moderation is one area where I think generative AI is going to be a fantastic benefit. What's next for you? My organization is really focused on growing the platform. Our focus areas for the next couple of years are really kind of three major spaces. This episode is brought to you by Pendo the all-in-one product management platform for any type of application. With Pendo, you don't have to bounce around multiple tools to figure out what's really happening inside your product. Pendo makes it easy to answer critical questions about how users are engaging with your product and then turn those insights into action. Also, you can get your users to do what you actually want them to do. Visit pendo.io slash product school to create your free account today and start building better experiences across every single corner of your product. That's pendo.io slash product school. Hey, this is Carlos, CEO at Product School and your host on the Product Podcast. Today's guest is the VP of Product and Engineering at Twitch, Jeremy Forrester. Twitch is the largest live streaming platform in the world. It was acquired by Amazon in 2014 for almost $1 billion. And as of last year, it has over 140 million monthly active users, 2.5 million concurrent viewers on average, and generated over $3 billion in revenue. Jeremy has risen through the ranks of the company over the last eight years. Previously, he had products at X. During our conversation, we covered the evolution of Twitch from a marketplace focused on gamers into all kinds of entertainers, how to structure a roadmap around themes, how content creators are innovating with AI-generated avatars and voicers, KPIs to measure the success of each part of the marketplace, how his product org is structured, and a framework for healthy escalations that facilitate decision-making. Welcome to the show, Jeremy. Thank you very much for having me, Carlos. This is a random fact that I need to ask you about. So you worked on Vine for Windows Phone. Yes. What is that? Uh, well, so at the time I was working at Twitter um, and we just acquired the, the Vine product and the Vine company before they launched. Uh, and one of the things I was responsible for there was actually kind of porting Twitch's applications to Windows Phone. So it was my job to take the core Vine product, work very close with the Vine team and bring it over to Windows Phone users. Um, it was uh, it was a fascinating project because I really, you know, the Vine team were a really great team. They were based out of New York and, um, you know, uh, really great to work with them. But it's always interesting because obviously Vine is a, is a you know, uh, now a historic product that the people often reference that ultimately didn't pan out. And, you know, I was responsible for shipping them on Windows Phone. Again, you know, a, a operating system that ultimately didn't pan out. So even though it's like one of the most fun projects I worked on, it's like probably lost, lost to the years now. And I mean, Gen Sears might not know this, but in my opinion, Vine was literally that pioneer into what today is the Instagram Reels or even the, the TikTok short videos. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at the time, uh, you know, we saw massive growth in Vine. It was one of the first applications that was really focused around sharing video. Um, you know, for people that don't know, they took a they took a, a six sep six second looping format. So you're incentivized to create really short videos that looped. People use the format in really creative ways to create kind of not very much like you see on TikTok today. Kind of you know, videos that amaze you that make no sense that you have to understand how they were made. Um, and a lot of people were using it in very creative ways. Uh, I think what we saw after Vine launched is uh, Instagram videos uh, followed. They, they followed fairly quickly with the, you know, allowing users to share videos to Instagram. And at the time also Musical.ly was picking up a little bit, which ultimately, you know, became TikTok in the end. So they were very much on the forefront, but but didn't quite make it to kind of the, the meteoric rise that we have 
with the TikToks of the world now. So you've been at Twitch for eight years and I'd love to learn more about what the product was when you joined as a technical PM and what's the evolution up until today? Yeah, I think the core of the product has always roughly remained the same, which is, you know, Twitch is really passionate about being one of the best places or the best place for people to, for creators specifically to monetize live streams. Um, uh, so, you know, when I joined, the, the, the fundamentals of the product were there. Streamers could stream, viewers could interact with them through chat, um, and, you know, you could subscribe to streamers and, and give them money. Um, and, and fundamentally, the, the core product is still the same. Like, that is still the, the, the heart of what makes Twitch great for streamers and viewers. Um, I think some of the biggest evolutions, especially some of the stuff that I've been involved in, is when I joined the company... Um, all of the content on the platform was uh, sorted and ordered by popularity. So we basically, we showed you like, what was the stream with the most viewers down at the bottom to the stream with the least viewers. And at the time it was, you know, perfectly viable ordering because popularity is a great signal of content quality. Um, but it did, it was exploitable. People could try and exploit the system through using nefarious tactics like view botting to try and gain ranking and then gain more organic traffic because of it. Um, but also in the end, it just wasn't personalized. So I think one of the biggest things that I've worked on in my time at Twitch was, you know, over the course of five years, we systematically replaced all of like the discovery mechanisms. We, we call discovery any kind of feature that allows a viewer to find a stream. Um, we replaced all of the popularity based discovery mechanisms with uh, recommended based sorting orders. So I did a lot of work with the machine learning team to really move from you know, what is it, the same view for everyone to a personalized view kind of tailored for you based on your viewing history and your location and, and, and many other factors as well. I think that's been one of the biggest changes. Um, and then outside of, you know, the changes to discovery, I think we've spent a lot of time as a company really focusing on giving tools to creators and viewers to kind of deepen the engagement between the two. So allowing... Um, creators to post polls or uh, allowing viewers to accumulate what we call channel points and spend them. Um, there's lots of different, you know, features that we've added to really kind of deepen the engagement between a viewer and a streamer when they're live. Yeah, so let's talk about some of those indicators that tell you that um, a user is enjoying certain content. So that type of content can be prioritized on their, on their feed. I, I remember the uh, head of Instagram was talking about how they measure the amount of videos that are being sent via DM to a friend because that indicates yeah. that it's really good. But that goes beyond the classic like or comment on a public video. So what are some of those leading indicators for you? Some of the leading indicators on that the content is good. Um, uh, at Twitch, we look like our, the metric we primarily look at is uh, what we call a successful video play. Now, this isn't a leading indicator, but a successful video play is a user clicked on a video and they watched it for a, you know at least five minutes of time. That for us is ultimately um, you know success. Uh, that for us is, says that like, oh, this, this user found a piece of live content that they like a lot. In order to get people to do that, um, we look a lot at a lot of different metrics. We look at what um, users click at and then you know bounce from. We look at um, uh, we look at what users kind of uh, don't click on. Um, we look at earlier indicators like one minute plays. Like did they watch for at least one minute? Um, you know, especially we recently launched a feed product, which has allowed us to gather a lot more signals in terms of what content people linger on versus what content people swipe past. I think there's a lot of different metrics that we use to kind of evaluate, okay, is, is, is a viewer going to like this piece of content, especially across their session as they, you know, and across multiple sessions? Yeah, because what, one of the differences that I see compared to Vine, for example, Vine was had a, had a defined format. They say, hey, it's up to six yeah. seconds, so you know what to expect. In your platform, I see a lot of length variability, right? And see short videos as well as like multi-hour long videos. So how do you go about ensuring that even though there's no completion, there is still a good indicator that the, the user enjoyed what they saw? Yeah, I mean, that, that's where that five minute play really comes in. I would say that that is one of the fundamental challenges of live content versus, um, you know, uh, recorded VOD content. I think with recorded VOD content, um, you can gain an understanding uh, through multiple different mechanisms of whether, you know, let's take a, 
a six second vine is interesting or not. You can look at how many people view it, how many people share it, how many people like it. There are lots of indicators to say, oh, this is an, a nice piece of content. And I think if you look at the market, there are a lot of businesses or there's a lot of you know apps, social apps that um, use the early signal from you know 100 viewers who view that piece of content to understand should they fan this piece of content out to a, a thousand viewers or a hundred thousand viewers or a million viewers. And they use kind of those early indicators from the first sets of users who watch videos to understand how much they can push them. The problem with live content is you really don't have necessarily that understanding that at this given time, this piece of content is interesting. So we have to rely on like, how much do we think the viewer um, likes this particular creator or likes similar content in order to gain an understanding of, do we think this user is gonna like this particular stream? And even then, we can make a really great recommendation for someone and we can send them into a live stream, but at that moment, that live stream may be boring. Uh, the streamer may have gone AFK, they may go to the bathroom and there may be no one there. Um, so it, it it does pose a set of fundamentally different challenges from traditional kind of VOD content. Yeah, and another challenge that I would like to discuss with you in this type of marketplace is how do you define a, a content creator? I know that Twitch found early success in the gaming category and now it branched out into other types of categories. So what are some of those and, and how do you treat the different content creators? Yeah, so for us, I think fundamentally, um, we start by looking at the type of content that works for our format. So Twitch is live streaming, um, it is community orientated, um, and it is long form. Uh, so, you know, what we look for in terms of what might be successful on Twitch uh, in, as types of content um, are really a couple of different indicators. Uh, is this an activity that a streamer can do um, multiple days a week because building community takes time and repetition. You can't just stream once a month and expect to maintain a community and an audience who wants to watch you. Um, you really have to stream frequently. So is this the type of activity that someone can do multiple days a week without it becoming stale or boring or alternatively, you know, like physically difficult for them? Um, uh, so that's one. Um, is And then the second kind of thing that we really look for. So, sorry, <laughs> we look at, we look at repeatability. Um, and then we look at kind of like inherent entertainment, entertainment content, or like entertainment value. Um, so let's, let's talk about gaming for a second. So gaming is a really obviously important vertical for Twitch. Um, but what makes it really good on Twitch is, uh, the fact that you can play video games a lot. You can play the same video game over and over again, especially m online multiplayer games like Battle Royales. You can play games of Fortnite for six hours in a row and each one of them is going to be different. And then each one of them is going to be inherently entertaining because you don't know what the outcome is going to be on the live stream. Um, and then you can play it multiple days in a row and the game developers um, keep the content fresh. So they are always keeping... Um, they're always updating the games so that there's new content coming in, which then streamers can then play or, you know, play and show to their audience. So when we look at other verticals, we try to look at, oh, you know, is this something that's entertaining? Is this something that people can do um, and, you know, frequently and repeatedly? Um, so that's why, you know, we recently announced the DJ program. DJs is a great example of this. It's an activity where people can go and have a DJ set every night. And they can always make it different and varied, and it's always going to be entertaining for viewers. Yeah, I like that expansion from gaming to entertainment as a whole. I'll give you another example. I'm originally from Spain, and I know that the Spanish-speaking community is huge. Like in particular, this this streamer Ibai, right? Like they, he yeah. recently hosted this massive event at the Real Madrid yep. Stadium. La Balada. Yeah. Oh my God! Right. So maybe you can educate like the the English speaking community on what's really happening outside. Yeah. I mean, the Spanish market is a, is a fascinating market. So there are a number of really large streamers, but Ibai that you mentioned is, is one of the biggest. Um, he recently hosted an event called, uh, La Valada, which is, um, it's a, it's a boxing and music event. And essentially he gets content creators across Twitch, across YouTube and other platforms. Um, and then he puts them in boxing matches together. And then in between each match, he brings on famous artists, both from the Spanish speaking world and, and the English speaking world. This most recent Lavalada, which broke, um, you know, our records, both the record for the stream with the highest, most of concurrent viewers, as well as our site wide record. Um, 
had Will Smith as an example performing uh, musical acts in the intermediary. And it's just, it's such a big cultural phenomenon there. It's, it's amazing to see. Um, and it's something that, that he's built up over multiple years. This is the fourth one that he's done. And it's just, it's been so fantastic to see kind of the success of that event, but also the success of, of Spanish streamers as well. Like Twitch is really a, um, a very popular platform in Spain. And, and, um, and these creators are really like leading the forefront of content creation and, and across multiple verticals. Yeah. I mean, they're really becoming celebrities in a way. And, and I think the other type of celebrities are also participating in, in, in Twitch. In some cases, I remember the famous moment when Drake donated some money to Ninja. He was playing Fortnite. So how do you think about treating those type of VIPs, like special content creators, either because they have a tremendous following or those celebrities that now are getting into the, the streaming game? Yeah, so... Um We love events like that. There was recently a stream uh, where Kai Sinat, one of our biggest streamers in North America, if not the biggest streamer in North America, um, recently streamed with Kevin Hart. He had Kevin Hart over on his stream and they they kind of just hung out together. And that was also a fantastic stream. We look at these moments as being kind of key to to bringing more people to Twitch, to really kind of broadening the appeal of Twitch and, and helping people realize that like, Twitch is not just a platform for gamers. Um, And not just a platform where just people play video games. It's like really exciting live moments happening all the time on Twitch. Um, and then how we look at the, the, the streamers and the audiences, I would say one of the interesting things is where we have found success is collaborations like these, where you have a successful streamer who streams a lot and builds a community and has a loyal audience who watch them regularly, um, bring celebrities into their world. Um, so like we had a, there was a stream a few years ago where AOC streamed among us with, um, a number of Twitch streamers. And I think that's been a really successful format for us. I think what we found when it comes to pure celebrity is, um, if a celebrity started their own Twitch channel and streamed once they would get viewership, people would turn up. It's always exciting to see someone you, you are, um, passionate about live. Uh, but the heart of Twitch's product is really community. And it's really about building a kind of a community between a streamer and, and their viewers and the viewers among one another. And that really takes um, time and multiple streams. And so what we found is like the people who are most successful are people who are inherently entertaining, um, but also can really lean into the platform and stream, you know, frequently enough so that when they build a viewership, that viewership stays with them and becomes loyal fans of their and parts of their community. And, and I'm a big believer in community. I actually think it's a huge moat. Um, so I, I guess Twitch would be one of the first, if not the first, uh, company that started this type of live streaming movement. And as the market grew, and now we see other players in the space, how do you think about positioning your product in a way that allows you to maintain that type of momentum that you created? Yeah, I think the biggest positioning and differentiator for us is um, one Uh, our focus on live streaming as our core product. I think that's what really sets us apart. Now, because as you mentioned, many of these social platforms have live streaming as an element and they're all v viable platforms. Like if you have a large following on Instagram and you wanted to go live once to show them something cool, yeah, you should go live on Instagram. That, that's great. You can reach your audience there. Um, but it's not their core business. Um, and their core business is photos and with your friends, but also reels. Let's put that aside. Um, whereas for us, live streaming is our core business. Um, and we want to focus on making Twitch the best place to monetize live streams. So we want to continue to deepen engagement between viewers and streamers and deepen their monetization potential and the amount of money that they can make per hour of, of live streaming. Um, so that, that's our primary differentiator is like, that is always going to be our core business. It's always going to be our focus. And we're always going to focus on trying to do what's right for streamers. Whereas I think for many of our competitors, not all of them, but many of our competitors, live streaming is a, is a, is a secondary business or a tertiary business where it, it's a nice to have. They offer it because they should offer it. And it, you, you know, you should be able to live stream on the platform, but it's not, it's not a business that they particularly want to grow. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's your core product versus uh, an extra feature for others. I, I, I get it. And so if you were to break that down into a roadmap, what's next for you? What's next? Um, 
For me, uh, so my organization is really focused on growing the platform. Um, and our focus areas for the next couple of years are really kind of three major spaces. So one is um, uh, continue to invest in our mobile application and make our mobile experience better. I think for many years, um, Twitch has been a predominantly uh, kind of website PC based platform. Um, and that's primarily because we're very heavy on interaction. We're very heavy on long form sessions. And therefore it actually makes sense that like web is one of the best places to consume Twitch content because it's very easy to chat and it's very easy to watch for multiple hours. Um, but you know, we have obviously as many people have seen more of a shift towards mobile and it's now becoming, you know, uh, while it's not where the majority of consumption comes from, it is where the majority of viewers are. So, um, while we've always had mobile apps, it's like, we've never had mobile apps. We're really invested in trying to make those experiences better. Uh, so we recently launched a feed product, um, and we're kind of, we're redesigning the app to make that the default experience. Our feed is a little bit different from, um, you know, TikTok's feed. Our feed, the, the purpose of our feed is not to, um, uh, it's not to get people just consuming the feed and, and just swiping forever. Our feed is really meant to help viewers find a stream that they want to watch for a long session. Uh, part of the reason for this is because um, there's, you know, discovering live content is hard. There's a lot of friction in that experience. And there traditionally has been a lot of friction in that you have to, in, in order to actually understand like, you know, this, this thing that's happening right now that's live, and do I want to watch it? You really have to consume, you really have to actually start watching it to answer that question. Um, there might be some indicators that say, I don't, I'm not interested in this. So I'm, maybe a streamer you like is playing a game you don't. But for most cases, you really have to go into the stream and consume a little bit of it to understand, is this stream for me? Does this vibe kind of fit what I want? Um, does this match my, you know, what, what I'm here to watch? So from the feed, we're really making it easy to consume and, and try out a bunch of live streams before deciding which one you want to watch. Um, so that's focus area number one. Um, number two is uh, really helping streamers take uh, derivative content from their live streams and share it out to other social platforms. Um, so about a year ago, a little over a year ago, we launched what we call the uh, clip exporter, um, which allows you to take a clip, which is a up to 60 second uh, snippet of a live stream and just export it straight to well, edit it to be portrait and then export it straight to YouTube or TikTok. Um, we're going to keep focusing on that. We want to improve our tools that make it very easy to kind of when an exciting moment happens on Twitch, make it really simple for creators to just share that out to their following on other platforms or export it to their drafts and their TikTok so they can go and, you know, edit it later in TikTok and add more features to it and share it out. But how do we just increase the amount of, and well, increase the amount and decrease the burden uh, of sharing content out? Um, to the world so that, you know, all of the exciting moments that happen on Twitch, multiple people see. And then, and then the last focus area, I'll be quick, is, uh, is uh, increasing the diversity of creators on the platform. So continuing to invest in things like DJs, continuing to invest in, in areas that allow um, non-traditional or uh, non-gaming creators, I would say, uh, find success on the platform. This episode is brought to you by Apple the next generation A-B testing and feature management platform built for modern growth teams by alums from Airbnb and Stitch Fix. With Epo, you can increase experimentation velocity while unlocking rigorous deep analysis. From setup to troubleshooting to analysis, Epo makes experimentation easy. An accessible UI makes it easy to dig into performance. An out-of-the-box reporting makes it easy for you to avoid annoying prolonged analytics cycles. Check out why companies like Twitch, Miro, and DraftKings rely on Epo. Visit getepo.com slash product school and 10x your experiment velocity. That's getepo.com slash product school. One thing that I didn't hear you talk about, which makes me curious, is the um, connection to external devices such as uh, PlayStation or Xbox. Or it's a lot of the gaming that happens outside the traditional laptop display. So how much of uh, focus is, is there on also making it easier for those type of gamers to then share some of those experiences back to um, you know, a, a social media network? Yeah, um, it's still an important focus for us. Uh, we have applications on Xbox, we have applications on PlayStation, um, on many of the smart TVs, um, and we work very closely with the 
um, you know, the manufacturers uh, of those devices to actually allow people to stream directly from them as well. So it is a big source of creators for us. Uh, lots of people, you know, the first time they go live, maybe from their PlayStation because they don't have a PC and an expensive setup and microphones and cameras, but they do have a PlayStation, you know, maybe they have a webcam. And, and for many people, that was how, you know, they started on Twitch as they went live from those devices. Um, so we'll continue to be a focus for us uh, in terms of making sure that that experience is great and making sure that people can watch streams on those devices. Um, but uh, in general, like there's not a lot more to be done there. Uh, given that people can go live from the device, they can attach a webcam, they can stream, they can attach a microphone and they can have a good experience. Uh, it, hopefully they can build a community um, uh, you know, around those live streams. And then a lot of our other tools that we're building you know, come into play. So it's the same, you know, if you're creating live content, regardless of where you create it from, we want to make it very easy to create that derivative content and share it outwards. So, And another thing that I, I see a lot of opportunity on is uh, mobile gaming. Well, with the launch of Apple Arcade, in general, the use of gaming on, on mobile devices. I still haven't seen an easy way for those type of gamers to live stream. Is, is, that, is that a thing that you think will happen in the future? Um. Uh, yes, I think so. I think there's a couple of things that we'll continue to see um, that I think will continue to make uh, live streaming of mobile games kind of more valuable. Um, one is kind of the shift in the gaming market on mobile itself. So as I as I personally look at it, as I use, I play mobile games a lot as well. As I look at it over the last couple of the years, well, not last couple of years, last 10 years, say, mobile games have gone from like, really simple games that are primarily offline, um, that are monetized through ads, to more complex games that are offline, that monetize through kind of in-game mechanics, uh, to now I think what we see is a lot more online multiplayer games um, that kind of like really have much longer engagement cycles where people play for multiple years. I'm thinking games like Clash Royale or Marvel Snap or, you know, some of the COD Mobile and some of the... Uh, battle ga battleground um, battle royale games on mobile, like people play these for multiple multiple years, and I think that shift is making the content um, more interesting to viewers on Twitch. Um, some of it is these games have larger audiences, and those audiences want to watch other creators play them, or they want to watch other people play them so they look, can learn to get better, or they just are interested in consuming the content. Um, and uh, and then coming back to what I was saying earlier particularly for these online multiplayer mobile games, um, uh, they are replayable, they're repeatable. You can play, you know, at Marvel Snap for six hours on live stream and every game is going to be different because the aspect of playing against someone else brings in, um, brings in that level of unpredictability that kind of makes a live stream exciting. So I think the evolution of mobile games, we're getting to the point where the, they are games that people want to watch. Um, so now it's like, what are the tools... Uh, in order to help them stream, we do have um, we do have products that allow you to kind of live stream directly from your phone uh, mobile games. But I think what we see for most successful creators is they're still streaming from a PC. They are just plugging their phones into the PC and using that as a surface, you know, using that as a content source in order to, um, you know, elevate their stream and make it even better. Yeah, I'm surprised we've been going deep into different parts of product strategy for over 20 minutes and still haven't mentioned the magic word AI. So I need to bring it up. How are you thinking about uh, Gen AI? Is there any interesting use cases that either for you as, as the platform as well as for the, some of the content creators? Yeah, I think for content creators, um, I'll start there. I think there are a bunch of different interesting use cases, um, but I think a lot of it is making it easier for them to create content. Um, making it easier for them to uh, to kind of elevate their content. So I, I see, you know, VTubing today is a great example. Like that is not Gen AI, um, but I can easily see a bridge that says maybe in the future, you know, you have generated AI models that, that are actually animated, you know, through generated AI, you know, Gen AI um, underneath them in order to actually look, feel, behave human. And I see a lot of, a lot of startups who are focused on, um, building products that kind of enable this kind of functionality, not necessarily for streaming, but just in general, like how do I, 
how do I how do we have a generative AI avatar that speaks and acts and looks like a person? So I think that's kind of one evolution of like I still always think there's going to be a human somewhere, um, but I think it enables more people to stream because it's like uh, just like VTubing enabled more people to stream. Um, streaming is generally better when you're on camera. Uh, because viewers can see your reaction, it feels more human. You can build more of a connection with that with that person. Um, and the advent of of VTubing kind of and, and digital avatars uh, really kind of opened up the aperture of like who can feel comfortable streaming. Like they can still feel on camera through their avatar, even though they're personally not the person on the screen. And I think taking that layer back. I'm sure there are more people who aren't even comfortable with, you know, it being their voice. Um, uh, so, you know, that, that I think Gen AI just kind of helps open up the aperture there in terms of who can stream um, and, and what does it mean to be a streamer and what does it mean to be creative on the platform? Uh, because I think in a, in a few years time, we'll see some really interesting use cases come out of that. Um, for us as the platform, uh, I think we're looking at all the standard things. We're investing in all the standard places. I think, um, you know, moderation is one area where I think generative AI is going to be a fantastic benefit for us um, because, you know, we, we have billions of chats sent and, uh, you know, an ever evolving lexicon of, of, of words on Twitch. And I think generative AI can really kind of, you know, sh you know improve our moderation models and improve our ability to tailor moderation on a per channel basis. Um, and then I think we're also looking at like tools in which we can make creators lives easier. Um, so going back to like, how do we make it easier for you to find, um, find exciting moments in your stream to share them, uh, to, a, to a TikTok or, or a YouTube shorts. Um, you know, I think AI could play a role in that. Um, and are there other places in which we can kind of reduce the burden on streamers by giving them more tools, which are powered by LLMs and, and generative AI? I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about your product org. Uh, for a product that is a, a marketplace, um, how are you structuring your team internally? Yeah, I'll take one step back and say kind of how Twitch structures its, uh, its organization uh, from a product perspective is we have three main product organizations. So one is our monetization org who are responsible for all of the revenue, revenue generating products on the platform. So it's kind of ads, subscriptions and bits. Um, and then we have another org, uh, which is responsible for all of the trust and safety and moderation tools on Twitch. So all of the ways in which we keep streamers safe, we keep bad content off of Twitch and we give them tools to moderate their own communities. Um, and then we have my organization, which is responsible for primarily um, growth. In my organization, I, I kind of, I, I split our features up into uh, three, I would describe them three major areas. We have kind of the pure viewer facing features um, this is primarily discovery and how viewers find content. Um, so this is kind of search and following and recommendations, but they're really features that are predominantly the only customer is viewers. Um, then on the other side, we have the purely creator facing products and features. Um, this is things like the creator dashboard and the analytics we provide them uh, to understand how their stream is performing or the streaming tools and the stream manager that help them manipulate and control their stream while they're live. Like those are really purely creator facing features. Um, and then in the middle, we kind of have what we call interaction features, which is um, which is kind of any feature where basically it fits both sides of the marketplace and both customers. And these are fe features that really are features that allow creators and viewers to interact with one another when they're live. So predominantly that's through chat on Twitch. And we built a bunch of different features around chat. Um, but th that team is really responsible for building out new features so that either allow streamers to enlist engagement from viewers or allow viewers to get the attention of streamers. So, and I see that starting uh, this year, you, you went from VP of product to VP of product and engineering. Um, we'd love for you to expand on that and tell me more about how engineering is part of your product org. I'm currently running an organization that spans kind of product and engineering as well as TPM and a couple of different other functions as well. Uh, so, you know, we basically, we map, we map, we, we, you know, we'll, we, we try and map very closely product engineering and design, um, uh, together at, at every layer of the organization. So design's not part of my specific org, but we have a central design organization that we work very closely with, but at every level we try to say, okay, do we have uh, a product manager, uh, an engineering lead, an engineering manager and a designer, um, 
coupled together working as a team and then as they ladder up you know do we have a a product director a design director an engineering director um, working as a team in one of these areas and then as that ladders up you get to my level where I have a you know I have a VP of engineering who I work very closely with as well as a VP of design and, and we work very closely together on the problems at our level so at every level through the organization we try to have kind of the three-legged stool um, uh, in order to, you know, to really have those functions work tightly together. Um, and then, yeah, and then that ladders up through every, every layer of the organization. Well, one of the things that I can imagine is the amount of um, different opinions that, that you are going to be getting as, as your team and your scope grows. So consensus is one of those, uh, or politics, depending on how you want to call it. So how do you go about creating that type of uh, alignment with your team and, and still being able to, to move forward? Yeah, so I see kind of the role of product managers as trying to build consensus around the right decisions, using inputs from peers, using inputs from uh, data, from research, um, from their own product sense, uh, and then trying to build consensus as quickly as possible. And... Um, I think that's always one of the difficult parts of the job. And it, and it varies a lot from organization to organization. Cause I think in some companies, you know, uh, you know, whatever the product manager says, everyone else does and in other organizations. It's, it's a lot more a set of diverse opinions. Um, so I do feel in that as being one of the biggest, I wouldn't call it bottlenecks, but I, w I think it's one of the biggest areas of potential slowdown within a project is like, how do you build consensus quickly? Um, the tool that, that I like the most, uh, that I think is one of the most effective tools um, is in this particular case is actually escalations. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of escalations. I'm, I'm definitely trying to build an organization where people don't feel bad about escalating. Um, and it's part of the culture rather than it feeling like, you know, a dirty word. Um, and we always try and do um, clean escalations, what we call co-escalations, which is like, oh, if there is a disagreement between two parties, um, you know, they write a doc together, a short document together, laying out the problem and, and the different sides of opinions, and they escalate it up to the next level. And then, you know, at, you know, maybe it gets to my level. I work with my peers across design and engineering to, to make a decision. And if we can't reach a decision, we go up to the next level. Um, and I think what's really important there is... Uh, getting good at learning when you're in a productive conflict versus an unproductive conflict. Because a, a productive conflict is you're working through problems, you feel like you're actually moving forward and you probably are going to get to a good resolution. An unproductive conflict is like you're not actually moving forward. And if you spend weeks going back and forth with one another on an unproductive conflict, you, you may still not reach a resolution. So I think a skill which I try and impart on people is like how do you recognize an unproductive conflict so that you can use a tool like escalation, maybe in different businesses is something else um, to, to actually kind of break through that barrier as quickly as possible. I like that. At the same time, I, I have PTSD, you know, thinking about different scenarios in my own life where situations get escalated and still there is, there's no consensus among the, the executive team and a decision has to be made. Right. And I found myself calling those shots and trying to clarify the team that the fact that we're trying to build consensus doesn't mean that we need to lead by consensus. And I think that's an important difference there. Oh, ideal case scenario, yes, everybody feels good about something and goes for it, but also it's kind of suspicious, right, that a bunch of really, really smart people all think exactly the same way. No, I, I agree with that. And I think obviously Amazon has a leadership principle. It's fairly famous around disagree and commit. Um, I like a, a, a little twist on this one, which is disagree and champion, which is ultimately um, a decision will get made somewhere. And maybe it's, you know, at, at, at the executive level when the CEO says, no, this is the decision we're going to make. Like ultimately at that point, it's everyone's job to get behind that decision and actually champion it within the organization to ensure that we can have a success. And, and I agree, sometimes, like, sometimes you can get to a bunch of smart people who just disagree on things, but it's important to know when, you know, when to disagree and commit or disagree and champion, um, when to continue kind of pushing back, um, what are the strength in your convictions? What are your beliefs that are loosely held versus strongly held? And like really trying to define, you know, like 
uh, in understanding yourself, really trying to define like how much am I going to fight for this particular decision, or am I going to put my best argument forwards? And if if my boss comes back and says no, we're going a different direction, make sure I get behind that. Uh, Jeremy, uh, one of the things that I am passionate about is learning and. I believe that learning never ends. So in your case, as I see your career, um, what are some of the ways that you love learning and how do you manage to, 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 to invest time in yourself? Yeah, I, so I'm definitely, uh, I, I definitely, I don't have the patience for uh, reading um, books around, you know, personal development and learning. Um, it's just not something I've been particularly good at. Like I've, I bought some of the books recommended by people. Um, I can remember one time at Twitter, Jack Dorsey bought, um, you know, a book for the entire company that he wanted us all to read. Like I, I read the first couple of chapters and then I just couldn't do it anymore. I, I'm definitely more of a, a, an on the job learner. Um, I like learning through doing, which I think is one of the strongest ways to learn. I don't think anyone's going to disagree with that. Um, but then how do I make time to ensure that I am continuing to learn? Um, for me, it primarily comes from like seeking diverse perspectives and making sure I spend time with those people and making sure I spend time with people that have opinions other than mine or doing roles different than mine. Um, and really, uh, you know, or tackling problems different than mine and really understanding and spending time with them and trying to, you know, learn from them. I think that's always been one of the best opportunities to learn outside of just my day to day job. It's really like, oh, someone over here is doing something interesting that I know nothing about. How can I go and spend time with them? How can I meet with them? How can I have coffee with them to really understand, like, what are the problems that they're trying to solve in their part of the business? Um, yeah, and, and, you know, hopefully learn from them and hopefully take some of that knowledge forward. And, you know, if I ever, you know, if I encounter their work, uh, you know, I have a, a different perspective on it um, when I next see it. Well, it's been a pleasure to learn from you in this case. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs>